All right. So, if we make all this work properly. Good evening. It's really exciting to be here. I really, you know, this is one of my favorite places. And uh, tonight, I think, is a particularly exciting time. It's a hopeful time. You see that title up there. 70 years we've been at this, right? And you know, for a lot of that 70 years, things have been kind of going downhill. And we keep talking to each other about how it used to be and how it could be better. And tonight, we're going to talk about how it's getting better. That's the what next. And I'm really excited. My role tonight is to talk about what we've been doing and how we got to here. Satya is going to talk to us about where we're headed and where we're going and the way things are turning around. So I think it's a very hopeful time for us and a really important uh, turning point. And if we figure out how to do this. John just read you that, uh, that resume of all the wonderful places I've been. And, and it has been a, a labor of love, but some really wonderful places and been a lot of fun. I actually began my career as a deckhand on a commercial fishing boat in San Diego, California. And that connection with the ocean and with nature led me into university training in fishery science and marine ecology. And, uh, and by a series of adventures, I found myself living on St. John in the Virgin Islands as a ranger in a campground at Cinnamon Bay. And one of my chores was to take people around and show them the islands. And we had some people from the Navy and General Electric Company and NASA, the space agency, come down and say, well, we're looking for a place to put a house on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, we're going to learn how to live there. Now, you remember, this is the late 1960s, 68, 69. We were in a space race, right? We were all going to the moon. And we had astronauts. And the Navy was worried about Russian submarines, Soviet submarines coming up. And we wanted to know if we could put outposts on the continental shelf and live out there. And so that's what this team wanted to do. And I took them around and showed them some places on St. John. And lo and behold, they picked one of those places to put this habitat, conduct this experiment. And I ended up joining that team as an aquanaut. Right? So I got to, to live in the bottom of the ocean for 60 days and conduct research. It was so much fun. What an adventure. It was great. When I finished up with that, I played volleyball for the Army for a couple of years. And then I, uh, you know, remember, late 60s, early 70s? Um, yeah, and then I went to uh, Everglades. I spent 10 years in South Florida and built a research program at Everglades National Park and, uh, and discovered along the way that supervising 50 research scientists was not bringing me the joy and satisfaction that I wanted. I wanted to go explore nature in the ocean. And so in 1980, when Channel Islands National Park was created when it was established, it expanded a small national monument called Channel Islands National Monument that was established in April of 1938. And that's the 70 years, all right? It's been 70 years that people have recognized this was a really special place, that it needed an extra layer of protection, that it was worth taking care of. This was a time when the country was not doing very well economically. And President Roosevelt sent some of his special assistants out here to look this place over. He also spent them down to South Florida. And they looked around down there, and they discovered another special place, Everglades. The Everglades National Park was reviewed at the same time Channel Islands National Monument was reviewed. And they decided, yeah, we better take care of both these places. Uh, the park at Everglades was established in 1947. And we didn't get around to changing the monument to park here until 1980 which is when I arrived here and uh, began the, the career that I'll share a little bit of with you tonight. All right. But our purpose tonight really is to talk about what's going on out there right now. What are the conditions of the resources and where are we headed? Where are we going to go? And as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, how things went over the last 30 or 40 years and Satya is going to talk a little bit about where we're headed from here. Now, one of the things that I first saw when I jumped in the ocean in San Diego in the 1950s was lots of big things. Big fish, big lobsters, big abalone, and there were a lot of them. And uh, part of my experience of working on uh, fishing boats down there was to go out in the morning and catch bait. We would catch Pacific mackerel, and we would use those mackerel later in the day to go catch big fish, marlin and tuna and yellowtail. Right? That's what we were trying to catch. And every day, we would report to the newspapers what we had caught so we could attract more people to go fish with us the next day. Right? Now, 40 years later, people are reporting how many mackerel they caught. Right? We're now proud to report we caught the bait. That's a sliding baseline. That's what's been happening is that when you first get in any place, when you first experience it, you think that that's what's normal. 
Each one of us does that, and each generation starts at a lower point down that scale. And that's where we are now. We've slid just in one generation, you know, from the 1950s till now. We're from marlin and big tuna, right? Two and three pole tuna, big animals. So we caught the mackerel and we're proud of it, right? We have to keep that in mind as we assess conditions at the islands, in the park, and the sanctuary today, and understand where things were and what they could be again. That's where we are now. Now we're rebuilding, we're restoring the integrity and stability to this system, and that's what we're going to talk about. We know this is a special place. I know that almost all of you have been to the islands. You know something about them, or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't care about this place. So what I want to do in my few minutes is to uh, introduce you to the place, and I know that that's superfluous for most of you, but I want to remind you of this place and what makes it special, and uh, why not only the people who live here think it's special because it's our backyard, but because the whole world is looking at this place, and remind you of what makes it uh, as uh, interesting as it is, and I hope to foreshadow some of the stories that Satie is going to tell you so that you have some context for them. So, wonderful place, right? What do you love about this place? You really don't have any weather here, right? We just have climate, you know, and lots of sunshine. It's very mild, and it's a Mediterranean climate, right? This is the kind of place where human Western civilizations developed around the Mediterranean in Greece and Turkey and, right, wonderful places that people want to visit with these really cool, moist winters and warm, dry summers, right? and lots of sunshine. Moderation is the key here. This is also the crossroads of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Right? We have cold water bearing lots of nutrients coming down from Alaska, right? and it meets with warm water coming up from Baja California and some water coming out of the Eastern. Real quick, I'm just going to, you don't mind. I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure we have good audio. <laughs> Sorry about that. So just start at the beginning of this section of the field. Okay. I'm sure none of them have ever heard this before anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the California Channel Islands are at the, uh, the crossroads of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. We have cold water bearing nutrients coming down from the south out of the Gulf of Alaska and off the coast of uh, Oregon and it meets with warm water coming up from Baja California along the coast, and it swirls around the islands and then mixes with, water, mixes with water coming out of the central North Pacific. It all swirls around, mixing warm water, cold water, in the sunlight, right? And the bottom here is not flat sand, it's bumpy. There are deep canyons, basins, ridges, places that this water that's already swirling because it ran into each other now has vertical lift and drop into it. So it's mixing through this whole zone around here. That gives plants and animals really interesting microhabitats, places where they can live. So there's a combination of the currents, the physical topography, and, and everything are all mixed together, and it's tied to the land. We used to have rivers that ran. You remember that? The Ventura River, Santa Clara? They used to have a lot of water that came out and a lot of sediment and nutrients from the uplands. Well, people have altered that as we have altered coastal habitats in Southern California, but there is still a connection between the land and the sea here that's very powerful, and you see that at the islands where the streams still run into the ocean. And in fact, restoration of the ecology of the islands is improving that, is restoring some of the aspects of these physical environmental factors. In addition to these big kind of global forces that work here, we also see seasonal effects. Like I said, we don't have weather, we just have climate. But it's pretty predictable. You know about June gloom, right? We know things happen at certain times of the year, and we know that in the wintertime, winter storms largely come from the northwest, and that's the weather side of the islands, on the north and the west sides, right? But in the summertime, that all turns around, right? The south side, we get those big swells in the summertime that come up from storms in the southern hemisphere, from New Zealand, right? And so it changes. But those are important things for the plants and animals that live out here. They count on those seasonal variations occurring. And the wind blows in predictable directions at different times of the year, and when it blows off the continent from the north and the northeast, it blows the surface waters away, and that brings deep water up from the bottom of the ocean into the sunlight, bringing the nutrients up that starts a food chain, that starts with phytoplankton, 
and leads to zooplankton and into small fish like anchovies and sardines and into krill that leads to whales and tuna and pinnipeds, right, and seabirds and bald eagles. So we've got this whole thing going because of the environmental mixing that goes on here. We get all kinds of plants and animals that have chosen this as a place to live. So we see these seasonal cycles. We see longer term cycles that you're aware of. After you've been here for a little while, you recognize El Nino winters, right? Those storms and that rain that we get also brings with it warm water. So the currents from the south are stronger than they are from the north, and we get a, a shift of warm water from the eastern islands, from Anacapa and eastern Santa Cruz, all the way out to the west to San Miguel. So we have El Nino years that are kind of warm water. And they alternate at three to seven year intervals with La Nina conditions, right, that are just the opposite, cold water. Cold water is really good for the kelp to grow because that cold water has lots of nutrients in it, lots of nitrogen, and so it grows like mad, as much as a couple of feet a day sometimes. Right? So we get these kinds of cycles. So understanding the dynamics, the changes in resource conditions, it's important to understand these sorts of cycles. And now that we've been studying this system for the last 40 or 50 or 60 years, oceanographers are starting to get another pattern. They're seeing another signal in the changes. There's a longer cycle that some people are starting to call uh, El Viejo, right? This is the father of El Nino. This is the grandfather, right? This is the old one. And these are 25 to 40 year cycles of warming and cold, right? And so some people call these decadal oscillations. So we're talking about shifts in, thank you, John, shifts in uh, the oceanographic conditions that are consistent for a few decades and then they shift to another setting, right? And we see these sorts of things moving through the system. This is really hard to get a fix then on exactly what's normal here. We've got shifting baselines and alterations of people, and then we've got this stuff going up and down seasonally. We've got stuff that shifts with El Nino cycles, and now there's decadal oscillations. Boy, this is a dynamic place, and you have to have a lot of information to begin to understand what happens out here. Well, one of the things we know that happens out here is there's all that mixing. We have warm water from the south, cold water from the north. So if you jump in the water at San Miguel Island, you see a group of plants and animals that look like they're in Oregon or San Francisco. But if you go to Anacapa or Santa Barbara Island, it looks like you're in Ensenada, right? So we've got 1,500 miles of the North American coast compressed into these islands, all living together, very high biological diversity, right? and lots of different kinds of habitats. So we've got these zones that we can recognize, cold water, warm water, but they move, they slosh back and forth. And that area in the middle, that transition zone, one day it's Ensenada, the next day it's Coos Bay, right? And you go, whoa, what was that? Well, there's a special group of plants and animals that like it in places like that. And so we have a special assemblage of, of critters that do that. And these kelp forests out here are pretty remarkable. These are rainforests in the sea. They support at least a thousand species of large plants and animals that we can see. I'm not talking about plankton. I'm not talking about the little tiny things. These are the big things. So this is a pretty incredible community of, of organisms that all live together around here. And they occur, again, not surprisingly, in places where you have Mediterranean climates like South Africa, uh, South Australia, Chile. So there are other places where there are kelp forests, but the ones here at the islands in Southern California are among the largest, most productive in the world. Part of that reason is because not only do we have the seasonal upwelling when the wind blows the surface waters away, but we have an area off of Point Conception that because of the shape of the ocean basin, because of the currents that come down and hit here, and because of the spinning of the earth called Coriolis effect, because of all of these factors, we get deep water coming up from the bottom into the sunlight all of the time. It's just bringing, it's a conveyor belt, bringing nutrients up into the sunlight that starts these food chains. And when they're stable, when those oceanographic conditions are stable for about two weeks, that's a long enough time to make the nutrients available to the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, and all the way up the chain that we get this incredible productivity. And that's one of the reasons we see blue whales hanging around out here the way we have the, the last few years. This is a great place on the face of the earth, one of the most special places where you can see this. And this high biological productivity is hard to see in the ocean because we can't see all the pieces of it. But if you want evidence, just go look on the beach, right? Look at the number of big animals that are hanging out on park beaches and they come here. These elephant seals, right? Fur seals, northern fur seals, California sea lions, harbor seals. Right, they're all hanging out out here. They're reproducing here. It's a safe place, and it's close to a lot of food, right? 
And I mean, this is like looking at wildlife displays on the Serengeti Plain in Africa. But in Africa, you're looking at antelope, right? You're looking at animals that eat grass. These are predators. These are top predators eating other predators that eat other predators. Right? We're near the top of the food chain here. It takes an incredible amount of sunlight and nutrients to support these kinds of populations, right? This is a special place on the face of the earth. There's no doubt about that. And in fact, there are a lot of other critters that live here, you know? What, there are 18, 20 million of us, depending on how you count it, between Santa Barbara and San Diego and back up against the mountains. We are altering this system and we are connected to the ocean here. Whether we go out there and fish or whether we dump our trash out there, we are connected to this place, right? And also, this community is incredibly diverse, incredibly diverse. Um, you know, they teach uh, academic subjects in Southern California schools in more than 20 languages. What other culture in the world does that, mixes in that way? And all of those cultures coming together here bring their values, their desires, their expectations of the ocean, of the coast, and what they want to do here. So when we learn how to do a good job of coastal conservation, everybody in the world will benefit from this. If we can do it here, it can be done anywhere, right? One of the consequences of all of those people and all of the alterations that we make to the environment for our benefit, for our community, for our economy, have a way of isolating these islands offshore even more than they were before. It's not just a matter of open water, it's a matter of habitats that were once common to both places. The estuaries, the lagoons, the sandy beaches, the rocky intertidal areas, the tide pools, all of those places were found both on the islands and on the mainland. But now on the mainland, most of the estuaries and marshes have been improved and turned into Marina del Rey's, right? It's a different kind of habitat. And so when big changes occur, big storms come by, or we get one of these 10-year cycles that changes the oceanographic conditions, if populations fail or wink out somewhere on the islands, in the past there was a source of replenishment somewhere on the mainland. Today, those sources are gone because those habitats have been changed, right? So the isolation, and we're now looking at the last best place for us to study nature, for us to understand what's possible out here, to reset that sliding baseline. Now, we're fortunate that people were far-sighted enough 50 years ago to say, mm, we need to understand this place better. You may remember that in the 1940s, sardines were one of the biggest fisheries in California, and they disappeared. And it was under the careful view of fishery scientists who were studying them and setting quotas and setting regulations to sustain those fisheries and they still collapsed. And that prompted studies that started with the oceanographic conditions, it's now called Cal Coffee, the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations, right? And so for the last 60 years, they've been out there collecting information about plankton, about water quality, and trying to understand how these systems work. We began measuring the vital signs of nature in this park in the early 1980s. That's another long-term data set. PISCO, the group that SETI represents, has been studying the islands for a very long time. And there's a group called SQUIRP, wonderful acronym, Southern California Coastal Water Resources Project. And that's a consortium of the seven Southern California coastal counties that all have effluent that they dump into the ocean, they pool their resources into this consortium so they can study the effects of sewer outfalls right, on the coastal ocean. These long-term data sets are the reason I can describe to you the dynamics of this system and understand it. So this is one of the best studied places along the coast. And it has a very long history of conservation. As I mentioned, 70 years we're into this at the Channel Islands. And um, it, it's an interesting place to work. Again, I talked about the multicultural nature of the community here. We also have multiple jurisdictions of overlapping uh, business between the federal government, the state government, and tribal governments, and who's in charge. And in the mid 20th century, we spent a lot of time, wasted a lot of time arguing about who was in charge. And we've gotten over that now, and we said we're gonna do this together in a cooperative way, and that's one of the reasons that we're making some progress, I think. Um, like I said, in the early 20th century, uh, we had some problems with, uh, with the various jurisdictions and things. The monument was established in 38, and the National Park Service began active management here in the 1960s. 
And they recognized very early on in the mid-60s that condition of the resources was declining, and so half of the National Monument, the north side of Anacapa, the east side of Santa Barbara Islands, were closed to fishing to let those areas recover and to provide a source of replenishment for the surrounding areas. But in the 1970s, the state of California argued with that and said, well, wait a minute, the National Park Service has no authority to create these reserves, and those are state fish and state lobsters and state abalone and state kelp. And uh, the Supreme Court agreed with them and said, yeah, the Submerged Lands Act transferred the ownership of all of those things from the federal government to the states. And so the state said, good, now we're going to start fishing in those places. They did create a small reserve on the north side of East Anacapa Island. So that was retained. That has been protected since 1968. All right. The federal government responded and said, well, we still think this is a pretty important place and created Channel Islands National Park expanded to include the three big islands, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz, and reestablished the boundaries of the park out one mile and said, state of California owns and manages all the living resources out there, but the National Park Service is responsible for monitoring the condition of those resources and making recommendations about what actions should be taken to better protect them. Right? So now we have a cooperative framework that allowed us to move forward. And we were looking at, well, what do we do here? We have these shared authorities and responsibilities. We have some goals that we all want to achieve. We want to maintain the integrity of the system, provide access for the public, and maintain the fisheries. We want to rebuild and sustain productive fisheries in these places. But the problem was fisheries were failing. The resources were at risk, and we had some serious problems. We needed some better information to make good decisions about what our strategies ought to be to move forward together. And we needed to engage the whole community in this. Now, the traditional way the fishery scientists went about monitoring condition of resources was to look at what we took out of the system. So we recorded the, the tons or the pounds of critters that we took out. And here's a classic of the abalone fishery in California. This is what we took out from 1940 until uh, the turn of the century. And uh, you can see we were taking a couple thousand tons a year there in the, in the heydays in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. But this is a little bit like monitoring your bank account by looking at the checks that you've written. You don't look at the balance or the deposits. You're just going to keep track. And the assumption is that the more you catch, the more there are. And you kind of go, well, wait a minute. That doesn't work at home. But we're doing that. That was what we monitored. And we said, you know, we need to look at the balance. We need to look at the deposits, the number of young organisms are being added. And that's when the Park Service added to the mix and made our contribution, which was to add this vital signs monitoring to measure the abundance and distribution uh, and the sizes of a suite of plants and animals out there so we could begin to get a handle on the health of this system and look at what was left in the system after fishing took some out. And some of the things we found were a little alarming. I mean, here was, you know, we have five species of abalone off this coast. One of them, in the deepest water, the white abalone, was supporting a fishery of 40 to 60 tons a year in the 1970s. And there were thousands of them in an area the size of a couple of football fields. And then, by the 1980s, when we started doing the monitoring in the park, we said, you know, there's not very many left. There's only maybe 10 or 12 on that football field. And now, in the 1990s, there's only one two football fields looking for the next abalone that's on the next two football fields. They were so far apart they couldn't find each other. This became the first marine invertebrate on the, on the endangered species list in the United States. And the center of its distribution is a national park, a national marine sanctuary, ecological reserves organized by the state of California. So among the most protected places in the public domain, and we're losing species. He said, we need more information about what's going on here. What other things might we be missing? So we started broadly to look at all the elements of the island ecosystems on the land and in the water. Started this monitoring program. And we do an annual assessment. It's like going to the doctor and getting your checkup. We're looking at about 70 different kinds of plants and animals at a number of sites in warm water, cold water, the transitions, right? Measuring all kinds of things, trying to figure it out. And we got a steering committee of various agencies so we didn't have these arguments about who's in charge. We just said, look, we're all trying to make a healthy place and get what we want out of it, all right? And that worked for us. I mean, we've actually been together now, you know, that was a couple of years ago, a quarter of a century working together. Some of the things we found are pretty interesting. There's always a discussion about what effects did fishing have on populations. Rarely do we have any information about populations before fishing starts. 
because funds are so limited, the Department of Fish and Game only has enough money to study the things that already have a market. Well, here we had sea cucumbers nobody had a market for in the 1980s, right? And so we were monitoring those as part of the vital signs of the park. And then when they ran out of urchins and they ran out of abalone, let's see, what else can I collect while I'm down here? Oh, sea cucumbers. So they developed a market, mostly in Asia, right? And they started collecting them. And what happened? We saw that before the fishery started in the uh, early 1990s, that dotted line there in the middle, that they were about the same inside the reserve at Anacapa and outside. But after the fishery started, the population inside the reserve stayed about the same, actually went up a little bit, but outside it went down. The other thing that we found that was really interesting was that the catch rate of the fishermen went up while the population was going down, which is a warning about how you interpret catch rates as a measure of abundance. It's akin to the monitoring the catch, right, like monitoring your checks, but not the balance or the deposits. You've got to have all three to make your system work and be accountable, right? We also saw over the first 20 years or so of the park, there was a big decline in kelp, which is the major structural element of this system. It provides food as a primary producer, but it's also the structure that affects the currents and sets up shade, and it is everything, everybody hides in the kelp and runs out, right? So you've got all the critters depending on the kelp, and we saw it declining, and it went down like 80% in the first 20 years. Every time we'd have an El Nino event, have the big storms, and it would tear open the kelp, it was like a forest fire on land. You know, it was a good thing. It would dump a lot of the kelp on the bottom, which was food for urchins and abalone, right? There were a lot of things that ate on that. But what was happening was after each storm, instead of rebounding like it used to do, the kelp forest just couldn't come back. So it was disappearing. Not only were the densities, the abundance going down, but the number of sites was going down. So that you can see those cycles. You'd have the big El Nino cycles and it would go down. And it used to come up and stay, but then it just kept going lower and lower with each cycle. We began concerned about that. Now, you remember this, right? This is the slide I just showed you. What I want you to get out of this is that there was a peak back in the 50s and 60s of the landings. And now I'm going to show you some abundance data that starts when the monitoring started in 1980, right? So the high numbers in the left over here we're really at the tail end of a very long decline, right? right? So we're talking about, we're down to almost nothing before the fisheries were finally closed. And they were closed not because somebody said, oh, we're going to protect abalone. It's because we need something to rebuild this population. Right? So those regulations are tied directly to the condition of the resources. And when it was almost exhausted, the fishery was finally closed. And we began to see these declines not only in the density of the animals, how many there are in, an, in a certain area, but also the number of sites. You know, all the sites we're monitoring, we're starting to lose them. We saw the same kinds of patterns in different ways for different organisms. The red urchins on the bottom here, that are quite low levels, all right, are harvested. They're big enough to be a good marketable item. All right. The little purple urchins in that top graph, too small at this time for the economics to allow a harvest and to make it worthwhile to collect them. All right. So the sea urchins on the bottom, they're saying, well, they're doing okay. They're just kind of bouncing along. They're at pretty low levels, but they're bouncing along. But what's going on in the top up there? They're going up really high, then they drop really low. It was is as we removed all the competition for these animals, we removed the abalone, we removed the big red urchins, the little purple urchins had no competition for food or space, and their big predators like sheephead and rockfish and lingcod and lobsters were also reduced, so not much predation, not much competition. Their populations are now limited by food. And when they run out of food, they get stressed, and disease kicks in, right? And then their population crashes, and then it goes back up again, and then it crashes again. So we've lost the stability, the resilience in this system is gone. We said, wow, that's a terrible thing. What can we do about it? We said, well, wait a minute. Let's go back and look at the reserve at East Anacapa Island. Tiny little place, only 30 acres. Here's this little tiny place. But look, the population of purple urchins is still low. You see little blips with the El Nino events in there. But it's really low. Outside in the fishing zone, they're going through these boom and bust cycles. So I wonder what that's about. Maybe even that little reserve is sustaining the integrity and stability and the beauty of that system and its capacity for renewal keeps things in balance, if you will. 
again, we look at large red urchins, the ones that are being taken. That fishery just began in 1975 in the mid-70s. Inside the reserve, population's at least stable, maybe slowly increasing, but it's stable. Bounces around a lot, but it's relatively stable. In the area adjacent to it, population dropped and stayed at those low levels. I mean, it hasn't disappeared, not driven to extinction, but it's at very low levels compared to what it was. But if you weren't there in the early 70s to see what it was like, you have no hope of understanding what red urchin populations could look like in this place. That's the sliding baseline. It slips right out from under us. This brought a lot of us to start talking about how could we begin to restore the integrity and the productivity of the whole coastal ocean here. And we said, you know, if we had more reserves and they were larger than the little one at East Anacapa, we think we could begin to rebuild this place. So let's start down that road. Let's figure out what we have to do to get there. And it took us a number of years, five, six, seven, eight, seemed like a lot longer at the time. But it took a while, but we negotiated what we thought would be a good starting point. It was a network of 10 marine reserves where everybody agreed we're going to stop fishing and try to restore the integrity of this system and restore the health of the ocean in this place and let it then begin to repopulate and replenish the areas around it. Those areas were established by the state of California in 2003. The federal areas that extend out to the, monument, or to the uh, National Marine Sanctuary boundaries, that outer line out there, out six miles, were added last summer. Right? So we now have one of the world's largest networks of marine reserves anywhere in the world. And the first step of this was taken in 2003. For those of you who did the arithmetic, it's five years ago. And in political systems, that's forever. You know, the Congress is on a two-year cycle, so we're in our third cycle, right? They want to know what's going on. So does everybody else. And that's what Satie's going to tell us next. Because we're really headed in a great place folks. Things are changing, and it's getting better, and she's going to tell us all about the details of that. So, to Satie for the good news. Uh, it's exciting to see what a long period of time people have been focused and interested in um, looking at studying the Channel Islands. And especially in the last five years, People have been very interested to see what has happened inside of the 10 state marine reserves and the two conservation areas that were established in 2003. And we've just presented the very first results at a special symposium in Oxnard uh, in February of this year. And scientists actually came to that symposium and presented their preliminary findings from the first five years of monitoring the Channel Islands Reserves. And I'm going to present some of the information, the key results from that special symposium. And I want to recognize uh, both my research institution, uh, PISCO, uh, Interdisciplinary Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, and our other partners, the California Department of Fish and Game, Channel Islands National Park, and Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. All these groups have worked together in partnership to both uh, design, monitor, and manage these reserves. And here they are. <laughs> uh, the green areas are fully protected marine reserves, and the two blue areas are limited take conservation areas. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the reserves. The scientists have a much easier time understanding the changes that they see there because fishing has been stopped in the reserve areas, whereas some fishing still occurs in the conservation areas. So it's harder to differentiate the causes of change. So I'll focus on the reserves. At the same time that the reserves were established, the Department of Fish and Game, the park and the sanctuary um, got a group of scientists and stakeholders together to figure out what were the priorities and key questions about marine protected areas and reserves. And these are the six key priorities that came out of that monitoring workshop. People wanted to know were there changes in abundance and size of the species of interest, fishes and invertebrates of interest primarily, as well as kelp. People wanted to know if there were changes in species composition or the structure of the community. They wanted to know something about marine habitats, 
the rocky reefs, the soft sediment, the kelp forest, were they changing? We also wanted to find out, do fish and invertebrates spill over or move out of reserves into surrounding areas where they could be caught by fi fishermen? And uh, we wanted to find out what happened to catch rates. We're interested not only in the fish, the invertebrates, and the other animals in this area, but also the people who are interacting with the region. So what's happening with the fishing catch rates, and where are the fishing boats going, and where are the re recreational boats going? So all these six questions, uh, we will try to answer some aspect of each of these throughout this, the next half an hour or so. I want to recognize the scientists who did this research. It's not something that I do myself. It's something that I work with a lot of different people to, to bring to you. And these are the scientists who contributed to ecological monitoring mm. from a variety of different organizations, institutions, and agencies. And you can see they work on a whole array of different topics, from looking at mapping the seafloor to the structure of marine communities and fish movement, a whole array of topics. We also had scientists working on questions about socioeconomics, of uh, things that related to uh, questions related to vessel distributions, commercial and recreational fisheries, and boater activities. So I'm going to share with you some of these key findings. The first question is really what is out there in those marine reserves and the surrounding waters? And this is a map showing the seafloor. And the area that has been mapped is shaded in red and a little bit of yellow and green. The red areas are rocky reefs, and you can see them just little flecks of red throughout the area. The reserves themselves are outlined in red, uh, but the shaded area is where the rocky reef occurs. The yellow is a mixed habitat, soft and hard, and the green is a soft sediment, and that beautiful gray-blue color hasn't been mapped yet to this precision, but it's exciting to note that most of the reserve areas actually have been mapped, at least to some extent. And the key conclusion here is that inside the reserves, the habitat is very similar to what we see outside. So in the design of these protected areas, I, we, we did a good job of capturing a representation of the Northern Channel Islands. Another question, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> just recovering from a cold. Another question we have is, what has happened with giant kelp over time? Gary showed us some, some scary statistics looking at decline of kelp and the effects of El Nino on kelp. Well, the good news is that throughout the Channel Islands, kelp has increased since 2003. That's not a long period of time, so we don't know what the long-term trend is going to be. But there has been a shift in, in the ocean conditions to support more growth of kelp, and that has occurred throughout the Channel Islands. It's interesting to note that there is a, a greater increase in kelp within eight of 10 locations in reserves as compared to surrounding areas. And these data were gathered by uh, various overflights monitoring the kelp canopy since 1957 and they were compiled by a postdoctoral student, Brian Kinlan, at UCSB. So what's happening with the fish? We've looked at the habitat and the kelp. What's going on with fish? It, it's exciting to see in just five years that we can detect a difference. For species that are targeted by fishing, we see that biomass is greater in reserves than it is in surrounding areas. This graph is a summary showing the average uh, ratio of biomass, which is a function of density, or the number per unit area, and size. So it's multiplying that size times density to get this number. And then we, the, the ratio we are taking here on the x-axis is the biomass inside the reserve compared to the biomass outside. So if this ratio is equal to one, then the biomass inside is about the same as outside. If that number is greater than one, 
then the biomass in the reserve is actually more than outside where fishing occurs. And if that number is a little bit, if it's less than one, then the biomass outside the reserves is greater. <coughs> so that's how to interpret these data. There are two categories that we chose to evaluate the data, species that are not targeted by fishing and species that are targeted by fishing. And you can see targeted species highlighted in orange actually show about 1.7 times greater biomass in the reserves than in surrounding areas. And non-targeted species, species that do not really gain any additional protection because of the marine reserves, those species don't show that same difference. There is some variation, so that that's a fairly close to one. And let's take a look at the actual species that make up these averages. So here are a whole array of different species from bat rays, Garibaldi, to tube snouts. These have a whole range of different life histories. They're really, they use different habitats, they have different growth rates. And so you see some variation in their responses. Uh, but primarily their average response is around one. So they're not really showing strong differences inside and outside on average. But if we add the species targeted by fishing, we see an interesting pattern. Of these 14 species, 12 of them show greater biomass inside the marine reserves as compared to outside. And that distribution would not happen by chance alone. This is statistically significant difference. Uh, so again, the main conclusion is when a species is targeted by fishing, it's afforded protection by the marine reserves and it's beginning to change and it, the biomass in the reserve is greater. If we, those are, all those surveys were conducted by divers in shallower waters in rocky reefs and if we put a submersible, a remotely operated vehicle, into the water and we send it down into deep water, it's finding the same kinds of patterns. For all the species that are targeted, we see this ratio of biomass inside to outside is greater for those targeted species. For the species that are not targeted, we see pretty broad variation, which is what we would expect. So let's take a look specifically at one of the most important commercial fisheries in our region, the lobster fishery. Um, these are data gathered by a group called Cal Lobster. It's a, a collaborative group that involves fishermen as well as scientists from UC Santa Barbara. And these data show the mean number of legal sized lobsters per trap in four different reserves throughout the, Ch the Channel Islands area where lobsters occur. And what you can see from these data are that the, the mean number per trap is greater in reserves, highlighted in red, than it is in surrounding regions, both near and far from the reserves. But there's a lot of variation. You can see that by the error bar that occurs on top there. Um, that shows the range of responses. And the scientists recognize this variation. They're not exactly sure why it's happening, but they think it may have something to do with variation in habitat in these different reserves. But still, you do see that important difference between inside and outside reserves. Now let's consider size of lobsters. Uh, again, uh, these data are coded blue and red. Blue is from outside of the reserve at Gull Island and red is from three sites inside the reserve at Gull Island. These data show the carapace length of the lobster, and it's given to you in millimeters or inches, depending on whether you prefer metric or standard measurements. And there's another important point about this graph. The black dotted line across the graph shows the legal size ab above which lobsters may be taken in the fishery. Below that, they, they are released through the escape ports in the traps. And the main point of this graph is that outside of the reserve, those two graphs highlighted in blue, you see that the size the, of most of the lobsters in the reserve is less than the legal size. And that inside the three, the three sites inside the reserve, highlighted in red, 
most of the lobsters are larger than legal size. So that's an interesting finding. The fishermen are actually helping to gather these data and their data from outside of the reserve, of course, <laughs> uh, show exactly these same patterns. And so it's exciting to see this kind of collaboration between fishermen and scientists producing very valuable results for management of the fishery. And this is rapidly becoming one of the major emphases of management relevant research at UCSB. So another question we might ask is, are there differences in food web structure in the reserves? Now, we've asked questions about how individual species are changing. Now we're asking questions about how gr groups of species that are defined by their role in the ecosystem, so what they do, um, how are those changing? And would that have any effects, cascading effects, through the system? And four groups that we've looked at are herbivores, which eat algae, planktivores, which eat zooplankton, carnivores, which eat invertebrates in this grouping, and piscivores, which eat fishes. And if we ask how have these changed over time using scuba survey data, what we can see, again, here's the response ratio. So everything above one is greater biomass in the reserve. Everything below one is greater outside the reserve. What we see is that for piscivores, the animals, that, the top predators that eat fish, other fish, you see about 2.6 times greater biomass in the reserve as compared to outside in the last few years that we've observed these changes. You see a little bit of change with carnivores. You see about 1.3 times greater biomass inside the reserve as compared to outside. Now, piscivores and carnivores tend to be fished, while the other species, the planktivores and herbivores, tend not to be fished. And so, again, if you think back to the differences between targeted and non-targeted species, this is consistent with what we found. The important point here, though, is that piscivores and carnivores consume other animals. So they're going to, if they increase, or if their numbers are greater, they're going to have impacts throughout that system, changing the system and re restoring it, in a sense, to something that appears more like the pre-fished condition. So a lot of people ask, do the fish move out of the reserves? Well, sometimes they want to know because they want to catch them outside the reserves. And sometimes they want to know because they want to know if the reserves protect those species. So there are many different reasons to ask this question. Uh, James Lindholm and his group have actually tagged fishes. They use acoustic tags and they have listening devices at the bottom of the ocean. And as the fish swim by the device, it picks up the record of that fish. So they can ta they've tagged three different groups in this study, sheephead, kelp bass, and giant sea bass. Sheephead tend not to move too far. Kelp bass tend to move at an intermediate range, and giant sea bass move a whole lot. What they found for female and male sheephead, highlighted in the red bars, they found movement out of the reserve of 10 to 14 percent of the tagged fishes. So they did move, but not too much. The kelp bass moved at a greater rate. Those that they recorded moved out about 16% 16, 16 of the tagged population moved out. But what, <laughs> what they <clears throat> wanted me to tell you is that more than 50% were never recorded again after they were tagged, which means either they departed the area so far that they couldn't be recorded, or they were taken out by fishing. And so we can't account for that portion of this. We, we can't explain it. But clearly, they're moving more than sheephead and probably less than giant sea bass. All the giant sea bass in the study that were tagged moved out of the reserve, and they moved to all of the islands. They, they were cruising all around, sometimes as much as uh, going uh, some 30 or 40, 50 kilometers in a day. Um, so the question, you know, clearly, these fish move out of the reserve. Those like sheephead that tend to be associated closely with a particular habitat type are more likely to move if their habitat crosses the boundary. They go along with that habitat. 
if it doesn't cross the boundary, if they come to a patch of open sand or something like that, they might just stop moving and not cross the boundary. So it really depends on the structure of habitat. And we can ask, are they well protected by the reserve? For sheephead, definitely they are. The reserve is a great design for sheephead, which established these territories and stay put, and 93% of the tagged fish were protected by the reserve. For kelp bass, about 77% appear to have been protected. And for giant sea bass, oh, that should be 25%, 25%, excuse me. Um, I just copied the former number. <laughs> 25% um, were uh, protected, and that's actually surprising because they move a lot, but in the North Anacapa Reserve, there's an area where they tend to aggregate, and therefore they go there and they spend time in that area, and therefore this group is protected. So designing the reserve around an aggregating site or a spawning site actually is a very successful strategy if you want to protect those species. Okay, so another question is uh, about people. Where do people go around the Channel Islands? And these data come from aerial surveys conducted by uh, someone sitting in a plane flying at low altitude across the Channel Islands. And they've been gathered since 1997. Um, they try to go up once or twice a week and do these surveys. And you can see all these records of vessels, all different kinds of vessels, throughout the Channel Islands. So the main point is people go everywhere <laughs> throughout the Channel Islands. And if we look at the kinds of vessels, just recreational vessels now, vessels that are engaged like sa sailboats or small sport boats that are going out for recreation, those vessels tend to congregate in Anacapa, around Anacapa Island to the east and at Santa Cruz Island as well. That, that's highlighted in the red dots. And that's a different pattern from what we see for commercial vessels, those vessels that are going out to do commercial fishing or engage in other commercial activities. These vessels go everywhere as well, but they tend to focus farther west in the islands. And you can see different highlights on Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island and some out at even San Miguel Island when the weather is good. <laughs> So there is a big difference in where the vessels go. Now these data showed the, the whole group uh, of data from before the reserves until now. But now I want to focus just on the change. Like, Were these vessels pushed out of reserves, the commercial vessels? Did they go somewhere else? Did the recreational vessels change their pattern? So that's a question we want to ask. These are non-consumptive recreational vessels, and the color shows the change. So for example, if they increased in a certain area, it'll be highlighted in red. If they decreased in another area, it'll be highlighted in blue. And you can see that they did increase non-consumptive <coughs> recreational vessels, people who might be sailing or out diving and not hunting. Those vessels tended to move toward the area around East Santa Cruz Island and specifically into the Scorpion Reserve, which is on the northeast side. It is a lovely place, but I think this motivation may have something more to do with the fact that this is pretty close to the mainland, and so you see a lot of activity in that area. If we look at changes in consumptive recreational vessels, these are vessels, uh, maybe a private boat where people are doing fishing, uh, something like that, or, or diving and hunting, those vessels tended to move from the North Anacapa Island Reserve to the south side of Anacapa Island, because now that north side is closed to fishing. So that's really where we see the greatest change. There's been a shift of those recreational consumptive vessels from the north to the south, and a little bit of movement um, from the north side of Santa Cruz Island to the southeast side as well. And if we look at the changes in fishing vessels, again you see some little highlights of red showing that more fishing vessels are going to those locations. Um, and we hope that in most of the reserves you see shades of blue, <laughs> meaning fewer commercial vessels going in that area. So those are the major changes. 
We didn't see a lot of change in the numbers of boats. Overall, the same numbers of recreational vessels are going out there as we saw before the reserves were put in place. And there's been a, a slight decrease, very tiny decrease in number of commercial vessels, but it's not sig statistically significant at this point. And one other big factor we need to take into account now is the cost of gas, not just what the regulations are out there, but it's, it's expensive to get out there these days. And so people may be making decisions to come either closer to shore on the mainland coast or to the closer islands. And those kinds of factors may drive some of these patterns, not just the fact that reserves were put into place. So I'd like to summarize some of the changes we've seen in commercial fisheries. Unfortunately, we don't have very good data on, uh, no data. <coughs> no, it's coming. It's coming. Um, but <laughs> there were estimates of potential loss for all the fisheries, but these were not realized in the last five years. Most fisheries were predicted to lose about 15% of their value because that was the amount of fishing going on in these reserves previously to their, prior to their establishment. But that wasn't realized. Now, the answers aren't too clear about what actually happened, but I'll tell you, four of seven of our major commercial fisheries increased since 2003 when the reserves were established, and those fisheries are crab, urchin, lobster, and squid. So the X vessel value, or the value of that fishery, has increased. It doesn't mean the number of people have increased. It, they could have decreased, but the value of the fishery has increased. Of those, two of the species increased less than in Southern California. So lobster and squid increased in the Channel Islands, but in Southern California, there was an even bigger increase. Three of the, the other three of the seven fisheries that I men mentioned decreased since 2003, and those are sea cucumber, rockfish, and sheephead. And two of those three species, sheephead and rockfish, decreased more in the Channel Islands area than they did in Southern California. So those are the statistics. Now how we interpret these, are it's very confusing because as Gary mentioned, these data are not showing us what the populations of these fisheries are doing. They're showing us what is happening with the value of landings. And that's driven by, in part by markets and the price of these different fish. It's also driven by changes in regulations, fishery regulations. Um, and we know for some of these fishes, uh, sheephead and rockfish, as well as lobster, these all have had major changes in their regulations in the last five to ten years. And though the reason the regulations are changing is because there are problems with managing the fishery. So we have to begin to think about those linkages throughout to begin even to understand these kinds of data. But I guess the, the most interesting point is we can't tie any losses of the fishery to these marine reserves at this point. Um, it's, it looks like fishermen have been able to continue fishing throughout our region, um, although there may be some shifts in distribution. And in fact, we have one fishery for, for which we actually know a little bit more, and that's lobster. And a, f a wonderful graduate student up at UCSB, Carla Gunther, has gone out and interviewed the lobster fishermen uh, directly, and she, her data are shown here. They highlight changes in lobster, numbers of lobster fishermen, and I'll show you in a minute catch per unit effort, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, Carla's data here show the number of fishermen at the islands, highlighted in green, and the number at the coast, highlighted in purple. And this is just for the Santa Barbara region. And what you see over time is that there has been a decrease in the number of lobster fishermen overall. Uh, specifically, you see after the marine reserves were established in 2003, you do see a decline at the islands in green, while you see a fairly steady level out at the mainland coast. So it does appear that fishermen who were fishing the Channel Islands, some of them have actually had to either shift to another fishery if their area was possibly put aside, 
or move out to the mainland coast. <coughs> if we look at the catch per unit effort, which is highlighted here with these two lines, uh, the green line is the catch per unit effort at the, co at the islands, and the blue line is the catch per unit effort at the coast, mainland coast. The catch is really a measure of performance. Um, it's lobsters per trap pull. That's what we're measuring. And you can see the numbers on the right-hand side of the graph of going from zero to one. Um, most fishermen are targeting about one lobster per catch pull. Otherwise, it's just not economically feasible for them to, to continue fishing. And most fishermen actually get that. But these numbers are averages for the whole fishery. So they include some fishermen who are not actually fishing at that level. And so the numbers are a little bit lower. Um, what you can see is over time that the catch per unit effort has actually increased. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the fishermen uh, are finding that they're catching a little bit more per trap pull. But there's an interesting switch that occurs in 2004. So before 2003, the catch per unit effort at the islands was higher than the mainland, just slightly. And at that point where the reserves were put into place, it switches so that the catch per unit effort at the coast, mainland coast, is a little bit higher. Um, in 2005, you see a big peak, and that was a peak in total land and total catch throughout Southern California and even into Baja. That was just a really great year for lobster. So, and good for the fishermen, <laughs> you know. And and the person who gathered the data, um, she's looking at what possible causes could be it for that year. And it, it looks like about six to seven years, maybe eight years before, was a good recruitment event for lobster. And so it, we really have to think in the long term for managing these kinds of fisheries. Because sometimes we'll see a peak like that that has to do with something that happened many years prior. OK, so another question is about recreational fishing. And in this case, I've got data on uh, the uh, party boats uh, or the um, commercial passenger fishing vessels that uh, go out to the Channel Islands and bring people aboard to go fishing. And you see data here from the, the northern Channel Islands in red, those low bars at the bottom there, and all of Southern California in blue. And you can really see uh, some, some interesting trends. The two areas track each other fairly well. So Southern California and the Channel Islands seem to be going in the same way. And between 1998 and 2002, we saw a decrease in the number of trips uh, for party boats. And after 2003, we see kind of a stabilization and maybe even a slight increase. So what's going on? There were ground fish regulations and nearshore restrictions increased in about 2000. Time closures were put into place. Rock fish limits were lowered. There were a lot of changes in recreational fishing that led to changes in how many times these boats were going to go out and fish. And more regulations were put into place in 2001, depth and time closures and the Calcod Conservation Area. All of these regulations were responses to ecological changes, changes in the fishery because we saw some declines, especially in the rockfish populations. So you can see that these regulations and probably other factors contributed to declines in the number of trips. And in 2003, we do see that stabilization. So we, we can't link it to the marine reserves in any way yet, but you do see that stabilization. And it doesn't look like the reserves added to the burden on these uh, party boats that were going out. So one more group I want to talk about are the private boaters. How many people own a private boat here? All right, a couple. <laughs> so maybe you were even part of this interview, and I thank you if you were. Yes, excellent. So here are the data we can present. Uh, these were gathered by Chris LaFranchi from the National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, he's asking the question of private boaters that he encountered in the Channel Islands, what, what of these activities do you do on your boat? And some of them are consumptive activities, like hook and line fishing, lobster diving, and spear fishing. Some of them are non-consumptive activities. And my favorite is the one that everybody seemed to, to respond to. 85%, 86% said they were just relaxing. 
<laughs> I love it. So we go to the Channel Islands, we enjoy this place, and we just relax. Uh, that's, that's what most people are doing. Some people are also exploring using their dinghy, hook and line fishing, diving, kayaking, and a whole array of other activities. But again, I come back to that. The reason we love this place is it's a wonderful place to get away from the mainland, enjoy nature, and just relax. And Chris also asked the boaters, uh, what did they think about the marine reserves? Because we, we hadn't really asked people. <laughs> And he was surprised, you know, overwhelmingly people supported the reserves in general. Um, that's, that's in the black, dark area. Most people supported the reserves at Anacapa and Santa Cruz specifically. And they also seem to support San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Barbara, although many of the private boaters don't go out that far necessarily, so they may be less familiar with that. But uh, only a few uh, opposed the reserves or, or strongly opposed the reserves, and some didn't even know about them. So this was a really good opportunity for Chris to tell them about the, the regulations that had been put in place. So I've gone through all six, amazingly, all six of these <laughs> top priorities, and, and we've learned a lot just in five years. We've learned that there are differences in abundance and size inside and outside of marine reserves. We see greater biomass of targeted fish species in the reserves. We see greater sizes and uh, um, numbers of lobster per trap inside the reserves as compared to outside. We have seen changes in species composition. We've seen the top predators, the piscivores, begin to, to show that big difference. Uh, biomass is greater in the reserves. And we expect that that will lead to changes in the future but we think that would occur on the order of maybe 10 to 15, 20 years in the future. And some reserves, for example, those in New Zealand, actually have changes still occurring 30 years later after they were established. So we're in it for the long haul. <laughs> We've seen the marine habitats in the reserves are representative of the Channel Islands region. We have captured a portion of this incredible place and the biodiversity is protected inside the reserves. We have seen spillover occur, although we do know, so that's fishes moving from inside the reserve to outside, but we do know that some, those fishes are being protected at varying levels inside the reserves. We ha we've seen some interesting results related to the changes in catch. Um, we can't tie those directly to the marine reserves at this point, but we, we do see that our predictions did not come to pass. And I think all of the, the predictions that we would see negative, a loss of catch, those haven't necessarily been realized. And that's exciting news because that means people may have been able to a, adjust and fish in different locations and maintain their catch um, while having the marine reserves in this area. And we've also seen some changes in distribution of vessels, but no real decline in any particular kind of vessel. Um, so it's exciting to finally have the, the results from the first five years of monitoring. And we'll be looking for, um, for many years in the future about how these reserves are changing. Um, and I want to thank a whole array of people who've contributed to this and who've shared their data so that I can present it to you tonight. Um, I'm sure I, Gary and, and I also would be happy to answer any questions you have about our talks. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I got one. Oh, I Run for the door. <laughs> any questions? I, I have one. Forget yeah. yeah. What, what you know, about 1950s, Alaska was studying the salmon, the sockeye, and so forth. What was